The concept of setting out into the vast unknown would be the stuff of dreams for many would-be astronauts. However, there have been other space-related disasters during the past 50 years that are more equivalent to an astronaut's worst nightmare. About 30 astronauts and cosmonauts have perished in the past 50 years while preparing for or trying perilous space missions. However, the vast majority of these fatalities took place either on or inside the Earth's atmosphere, below the Kármán line, which is thought to be the established boundary of space and starts at an altitude of roughly 62 miles. However, just three of the approximately 550 people who have traveled into space so far have really perished there. The dangers and challenges of outer space are well known. When venturing into space, astronauts face significant dangers in their pursuit of knowledge about the unknown. Has anyone truly died in space missions? Let's take a look at some of the worst disasters that hit the Soviet space program and the ways in which human astronauts have perished in orbit. NASA's Kármán line defines the beginning of space at 330,000 feet above mean sea level. But the Kármán line set by the world record-keeping body, Fédération Aéronautique Internationale, defines it as 50 miles in altitude. Rather than describing actual climatic or meteorological phenomena, these definitions are used for legal and regulatory objectives. Not all space exploration accidents, however, might happen on official territory. Therefore, we must also consider those that take place in space. Last but not least, we should think about the preparation and testing that went into these missions, as they were all part of an ongoing effort to explore space. There have been quite a few fatalities among astronauts and space travelers. The first person ever to die in space was on April 24, 1967. The space race between the two superpowers heated up in the early 1960s, with the Soviet Union emerging as the clear victor. Despite the Soviet Union's early triumphs, such as the launch of Sputnik and the first human into space, the country eventually fell behind. As the United States invested more resources into its space program, the Soviet Union's leadership saw the need for innovative new accomplishments. The Vostok spaceships that carried Yuri Gagarin into orbit in 1961 were replaced by the newer Soyuz spacecraft, and Moscow pinned its hopes on it. The Soyuz spacecraft was built as part of the Soviet Moon project. Even though the new spaceship wasn't yet finished in 1967, the government nonetheless decided not to wait any longer. The initial launch was scheduled for April of that year, and it was to be followed by the first interplanetary link with another ship, Soyuz 2. Two crew members were scheduled to move aboard Soyuz 1 before making their way back to Earth. Soviet officials desired another space success in time for the 50th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. Thus, they hurried the launch of Soyuz 1. There had not been a successful test flight of the Soyuz spacecraft, which is presently the safest vehicle for transporting humans into space. Everyone on board, including Komarov, was aware that the spaceship was inherently dangerous. Three unmanned test flights were conducted before the Soyuz-1 crewed launch. No one was successful. The first ship experienced technical difficulties, the second exploded on the launch pad, and the third capsized in the ocean. The goal of Komarov's mission was to add another feather to the American cap for Soviet space travel. Two Soyuz spacecraft were part of the ambitious plan. Soyuz 2A, carrying three cosmonauts, was scheduled to fly the following day, following Komarov's Soyuz 1 mission. It was planned for Soyuz 2A to rendezvous with Soyuz 1, and a member of the Soyuz 2A crew was to make the return trip with Komarov. The crew designated to the second mission were saved from certain death when it was abruptly cancelled at the last minute. The rocket launch occurred while Soyuz 1 was still an unproven project. Vladimir Komarov, a 37-year-old veteran cosmonaut, was also on board. However, issues began after Soyuz entered orbit. The opening of one solar panel was first delayed. Komarov attempted to rotate the spaceship such that the second solar panel faced the sun, but he was unsuccessful. Because of the power outage, the ship's life support systems were in danger of failing. The GPS also stopped working. 
The mission was called off by ground control as soon as it was safe to do so. When the ship's navigation system failed, Komarov had to take control himself. He got the capsule off to a good start on its descent, but then the main parachute, which was supposed to slow its descent, failed to open when everyone believed the worst was over. Due to impact injuries, Komarov passed away. They started clearing the wreckage and found Komarov's body an hour later. At first glance, it was difficult to tell where his head, limbs, and legs were located. It appears that Komarov was killed when the craft impacted the ground, and the fire subsequently reduced his body to small pieces, measuring 30 by 80 centimeters, wrote one of the officers in charge of the rescue operation. The reason the parachute didn't deploy is still a mystery. The death of Komarov was the first on a space trip. He was the first man to die in orbit. The Apollo 1 tragedy occurred three months earlier during a ground test, and the first cosmonaut to journey into space twice. The loss of a veteran cosmonaut, a highly trained pilot and engineer, a husband, a father, and a humble human being in such a sad, preventable, and senseless manner rocked the cosmonaut corps, the Soviet people, and the rest of the world. It took the Soviet Union 18 months to start sending humans back into space again. Secondly, Salyut 1, launched unmanned by the USSR on April 19, 1971, was the first space station to dock with Earth's orbit. Three Soviets set off on Soyuz 10 just a few days later, with the intention of docking with the space station and spending the next month in orbit. The Soyuz 10 crew successfully docked with the Salyut 1, but they were unable to enter the space station due to problems with the access hatch. Toxic chemicals escaped into the air supply of Soyuz 10, forcing one of the cosmonauts to faint on their unscheduled return to Earth. Nonetheless, the three crew members returned home without serious injury. Soyuz 11 made another attempt to dock with the space station on June 6. This time, it was successful. Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev, the three cosmonauts aboard Soyuz 11, were the first to successfully dock with the Salyut 1 space station. After boarding, they spent the next three weeks doing several tests to learn more about how the human body responds to being in weightlessness for lengthy periods of time. There was intended to be more time allotted for the expedition, but a fire forced them to evacuate sooner. On June 29th, the cosmonauts returned to the Soyuz 11 and began their journey back to Earth. And then, disaster hit. There were no initial issues with the parachutes during the return of Soyuz 11. From the ground, it appeared that the re-entry of Soyuz 11 was completely successful. The spacecraft successfully descended through Earth's atmosphere and landed in Kazakhstan. However, there was silence within the capsule when the rescue team spotted it after it landed. They found all three men, motionless, with dark blue patches on their faces and trails of blood from their noses and ears, the rescuers said after breaking through the hatch. Dobrovolsky was still warm, remembered Karim Karimov, head of the state commission that conducted the investigation. The rescue crew performed CPR on the cosmonauts, but it was too late. Karim Karimov, chair of the state commission, recalled, Externally, there was no damage whatsoever, in Ben Evans's book Foothold in the Heavens. They knocked on the side, but no one answered from the inside. The three guys were discovered unmoving on their sofas upon opening the hatch, with dark blue patches covering their faces and trails of blood coming from their nostrils and ears. They took them out of the capsule that descended. Dobrovolsky felt pleasantly toasty. The doctors used mechanical ventilation. Suffocation, according to their accounts, was the cause of death. Capsule decompression leading to asphyxiation was determined to be the cause of death when an autopsy was performed. The ruptured valve seal on the descent vehicle caused the deadly accident when it was being separated from the service module. At an altitude of 104 miles, the crew cabin was rapidly depressurized due to a leaking valve and the vacuum of space. The valve was located beneath the cosmonauts' seats, making it practically impossible for them to access it in time for a timely repair. Since three astronauts in spacesuits wouldn't fit, the tragedy delayed the launch of the next Soyuz spacecraft by 27 months, and the new design only allowed for two crew members. After the tragic loss of Soyuz 11, 
cosmonauts began wearing them during re-entry to increase their chances of survival in the event of decompression. Following the Soyuz 11 tragedy, the Soviet Union mandated that all cosmonauts wear pressurized spacesuits during re-entry. This policy remains in effect to this day. Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev, the first astronauts to enter the world's first space station, Salyut 1, perished in 1971. The Soviet Union chose to downplay the tragedy and highlight the astronauts' achievements throughout the flight, waiting two years to announce the official cause of death. Concern for the safety of their astronauts was a major factor in this decision, which came as NASA was preparing for the impending Skylab program. The crew was posthumously honored with the titles of Hero of the Soviet Union, Order of Lenin, and Pilot Cosmonaut of the USSR, and their remains were interred in an urn at Moscow's Kremlin Wall Necropolis. The capsule's landing site now features a memorial honoring their deaths. They are also remembered on the fallen astronaut remembrance plaque that the Apollo 15 mission to the moon that summer affixed to the lunar surface. They have also been recognized with a set of hills on Pluto and a crater on the moon. On the other hand, the worst death toll occurred in the tragedy at Plesetsk Cosmodrome, when an explosion rocked the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in northern Russia, killing dozens of people. The military espionage satellite aboard the Vostok 2M rocket was scheduled for takeoff on March 18, 1980. The rocket had a stellar reputation for dependability, with only one recorded incident in 16 years and no issues at all since 1970. There were no problems discovered in the rocket's pre-launch inspection. Unfortunately, a fire broke out as a lot of fuel was being added and it quickly spread. The disaster may have been far worse if the fuel trucks hadn't been moved out of the launch pad vicinity. According to reports, 44 individuals were killed in the blaze, and four more died of their wounds later. The state panel first placed blame on individuals in charge of fueling, but 16 years later, a separate panel cleared them of wrongdoing, attributing the fire's start instead to faulty fuel filter materials. However, the fire at the Plesetsk launch pad was not an isolated occurrence in the Soviet Union. In 1960, a disaster on a comparable scale struck the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Up next is the Challenger Space Shuttle explosion. The Space Shuttle was a partially reusable spacecraft operated by NASA. It was a reusable winged orbiter that launched vertically with external tanks and landed as a glider. The maiden flight of the Space Shuttle occurred in April 1981. After Columbia, the second orbiter to be built was the Challenger. After several postponements owing to adverse weather and technical difficulties, on January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded 73 seconds after launch over the Atlantic Ocean near Cape Canaveral. It was the first time a person had died in a spacecraft disaster in the United States. This mission, officially known as STS-51L, marked the 25th Space Shuttle mission overall and the 10th for the orbiter. The flight included NASA's first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe, who would have educational content from the shuttle, and its primary mission was to deploy a NASA tracking and data relay satellite and study Halley Comet using Spartan, shuttle-pointed autonomous research tool for astronomy. The launch and subsequent disaster were broadcast live across schools in the U.S. After record low temperatures on the morning of the launch reduced the effectiveness of the primary and secondary redundant O-ring seals in the shuttle's right solid rocket booster, SRB, the Rogers Commission, established by President Reagan, concluded that this was the root cause of the accident. Shortly after takeoff, the spacecraft's seals failed, allowing hot pressurized gas from the SRB to leak and destroy the attachment strut and eventually the external propellant tank. It is believed that some members of the crew may have survived the first disintegration of the craft, but perished in the subsequent contact with the ocean's surface. The entire crew of seven perished. Due to the large number of people, including many kids, who witnessed the Challenger tragedy live on television, it is possible that this event will go down as the most infamous in the history of spaceflight. The space shuttle program was put on hold for 32 months as the cause of the accident was investigated. 
The commission found that NASA managers ignored engineers' warnings about the cold temperatures on the day of launch, and that the SRB manufacturer had ignored test data, showing a potentially catastrophic flaw in the O-rings dating back to 1977. NASA formed the Office of Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance in response to the accident, and it shifted the deployment of commercial satellites from crewed orbiters to expendable launch vehicles in light of the Commission's conclusions and criticisms of NASA's decision hierarchy. To take the place of Challenger, the Space Shuttle Endeavour was cleared for construction in 1987 and made its debut in 1992. In the future, personnel will need to wear pressurized suits during ascent and re-entry, and SRBs will be changed accordingly. In 2004, the Congressional Space Medal of Honor was posthumously presented to all crew members. The U.S. Capitol's Brumidi corridors now include a photograph of the crew. In July 2015, the forever-remembered display at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex opened to honor their contribution and those of others. The Astronaut Memorial Grove at Johnson Space Center features a tree for every NASA astronaut. Both a lunar crater in the Apollo Basin and an asteroid were named for them. Across the country, memorials and monuments honor those who served. The crew of the Challenger were honored in the opening credits of Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, released in 1986. The accident and the crew have been the subjects of numerous books, films, and television movies and episodes. The Challenger Center was founded in 1986 by the astronauts' families to memorialize the mission and inspire young people to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There was also the Columbia Space Shuttle catastrophe in 2003. On its 28th mission, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated upon re-entry into Earth's atmosphere on February 1st. All seven people aboard were killed. NASA has been working on a replacement for the Space Shuttle with Project Artemis since the shuttle fleet was retired in 2011. This was directly caused by the accident. According to the results of the research, the issue began 16 days prior when Columbia was launched from Earth. When the shuttle was being launched, a piece of insulation came loose from one of the fuel tanks and punctured the shuttle's left wing. NASA officials had been under the impression that the foam separation wasn't an issue because it had occurred without incident during earlier shuttle launches. However, in this case, atmospheric gases leaked into the shuttle during its rapid re-entry through the small hole in the wing, causing depressurization and the eventual breakup of the vehicle. NASA's knowledge of the foam problem drew heavy scrutiny from Congress and the media. The crash investigation's main investigator, Pamela A. Melroy, stated that the crew was doing everything they were trained to do, and they were doing everything right, before the accident. Meanwhile, the Apollo space program was nearly scrapped before it even got off the ground. Several problems were pointed out by the Apollo 1 crew and technicians before a fire broke out in the crew compartment, killing all three astronauts. This was just another instance of putting fame before safety. NASA formally dubbed the mission Apollo 1 after the tragedy, despite the fact that it occurred during a mock launch at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. The Apollo 204 crew of Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward Ed White, and Roger Roger Chaffee perished in an oxygen-free fire caused by a stray spark. The astronauts could not have been rescued in time because the hatch door was difficult to open and moved too slowly. The crew and multiple engineers voiced worries about the Apollo 1 spacecraft's issues at various points throughout preparations, as seems to have been the case with an awful number of space flights. However, time constraints and the desire to be a trailblazing nation led to the abandonment of further safety measures in favor of an earlier launch window. Fortunately, safer spaceflight is a lasting legacy of these tragedies. We can't help but feel that some companies today are intentionally ignoring the lessons that have been learned, such as the importance of delaying manufacturing and product launches if safety issues arise. Here's to a future of successful aeronautical travel where passenger safety comes first. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.